Hello and welcome to CISL's webinar today on our most recent publication, Let's Discuss Climate, the Essential Guide to Bank Client Engagement. I'm Annabelle Ross, uh, the Programme Manager for the Banking Environment Initiative, and I will be your host today introducing the Banking Environment Initiative and Bank 2030 before handing over um, to Yasminka Endele, who's one of our program project managers on the um, guide, who will give us a brief tour before opening up to a panel discussion and a Q&A with you, um, with four panelists, our colleague from CISL, Thomas Vergunst, David Carlin from UNFFI, Peter Canning from HSBC, and Delphine Kenia from BNP Paribas. I encourage you as much as possible to engage with us. We will be having polls as part through the GoToWebinar platform during the presentation. We will also be inviting you to put your questions on both the guide and the important topics that surround the topic of bank client engagement through um, our questions uh, panel in the GoToWebinar platform. It's got a question mark. It looks like you're sending a question to IT, but it is to us. Um, so please do submit those as we go along so that we can bring them into the discussion. So far today, we have got over 200 participants joining from across the world. We have over 51 different financial institutions registered to listen to this presentation today. And um, so we thank you very much for joining. We know how busy our time is and um, we appreciate you joining us. Recognising how busy the sustainable finance landscape is, I'd like to move on to the next slide to introduce CISL and the Banking Environment Initiative to those of you who are new to our space within the ecosystem. CISL is the, center, the, sorry, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and it sits within the University of Cambridge. As part of the activities that we do, education is a huge part of that, and Thomas from the panel joins us from that department. And we also do research and convening, as well as an accelerator for SMEs who are looking to embed sustainability right from the, from the beginnings of their journey. In the research and convening, um, you have the Banking Environment Initiative, who, as I said, is, is, is me and the host, the host of this um, webinar today. And we sit alongside ClimateWise and the Investment Leaders Group, who represent the insurance sector and the asset management, management and owners that form the Centre for Sustainable Finance at CISL. We are joined across CISL um, by the Corporate Leaders Group, um, UK and Europe, um, who bring together corporates and financial institutions who engage on policy. You'll see on the slide at the moment, nine um, global banks, they form our membership of the Banking Environment Initiative and fund the research and development that we do um, and you'll see on the right hand side how we do that research. It is in partnership with academics. So we bring that academic rigor to the work that, that we put to you today and we have in the past as well. We engage across the spectrum to making sure that what we put um, to you is actionable and relevant and brings in different perspectives. And the collaboration that um, piece, the publications like the guide today um, saw collaboration with the insurance sector, with the investment sector, and with the real economy um, and the initiatives that form sustainable finance, such as CDP, UNEPFI, World Resources Institute. So again, we thank you as well for the collaboration to bring this together. And through our members, um, we bring together the people who actually bring this into the real workspace and, and hopefully create real economy change and accelerate the transition to net zero, which is the objective of this work. We help our banks um, through their membership to build internal capacity. There's project um, pilots that have been part to make sure that this guide is fit for purpose, as well as um, consulting to iterate and improve the language, the reality of it, as well as the ambition. And it is from that place that we start um, this particular project. To give you some tangible examples, I'll whistle through um, a few of our recent publications alongside this. So on the next slide, um, you'll see we there's two pillars to the Bank Environment Initiative's work. One is protect and restore nature. The other is decarbonizing the global economy. FinTech has been a focus of ours in the past, as well as um, the nature piece and banking beyond deforestation and the nature related financial risks project sees a pillar of six years um, worth of work. And we're currently working on the use cases for nature related financial risks. So I encourage you to look to our website for more information if those are topics you're also looking at. From a decarbonisation perspective, Bank 2030 and the Let's Discuss Climate Guide are the focus of today's presentation. Um, I will talk you through Bank 2030 in a second, but just so you know, we're also working with UNFFI TCFD modules and David and our panel 
um, joins to, to share a bit about that, and also the SME Climate Hub, both building on the work we've done to date so that we can continue to, to bring this um, forward and make it as useful and as actionable as possible. So on the next slide, I'll just give you a brief um, summary of Bank 2030, which was a piece of research um, put forward by the Banking Environment Initiative and CISL during 2019 and published in 2020, which looked, um, well, first of all, it interviewed 100 different stakeholders from around the banking um, sector and who work with the banking sector and mapped out the, the journey you see on the slide now. So really what it means to influence the low carbon economy and to take a proactive stance to working with real economy um, clients and companies so that we can see an, an acceleration to the transition. You see the banking as usual zone. Um, quite a lot of banks are still in that. That is looking at sustainability as a reputational concern as opposed to a fundamental existential concern. Um, it starts to, we're starting to see banks move towards the zone of transition, which is where today's pioneers are. And the zone of institutionalization is when by 2030, we will have seen banks incorporate forward-looking analysis in their risk models, that's transition, finance, risk, um, and we will really see employees, and that is the focus of today, um, embed and instigate those conversations with clients. Now, that needs to start today, and on the right-hand side, you see a wheel where we go through the different elements of a business and operating model of a bank. With the Banking Environment Initiative members, we scoped out the different phases based on this Bank 2030 research what really needed the focus of a collaborative space, pre-competitive, which is where we work as the university, so that we could enhance the action that the financial institutions um, around the world can take. The need for C-suite engagement is important um, and clear messaging, but really important, and we want to go into that in a minute, and I'll hand over to Yasminka, is this client customer service model where we equip and empower client-facing colleagues to, to feel comfortable um, talking about the complex topic that is climate-related risks and opportunities. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Yasminka now. So Yasminka, if you'd like to turn your video on and microphone on, um, and from there we can go into the guide and um, a bit more detail. So welcome Yasminka, one of the lead project managers on this. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Um, hello, everyone, from my side. Um, it's a very exciting. It's very exciting to, to be here today and to present this guide and to share all the knowledge we brought together to, to create it and um, to support relationship managers. So the development of this guide was a logical consequence of a bank wanting to be the bank of a net zero economy. So as you can see here on our curve of change, it is the outer layer, um, which is now it's time to be um, tackled. So that means that this bank will support all of their clients in the transition towards a net zero economy and building strategic partnerships is key. So um, equipping relationship managers who are client facing and so the interface between the banking economy and the real economy is from utmost importance. So throughout this engagement, this is where actually change and impact in the real economy will happen. We will go through all of these phases um, in a bit, but before we start, I would like to ask you, dear audience, um, one poll question. So, and you can watch on your screens. Um, what proportion of bank client meetings today involve climate-related topics for you? Um, during during this research, we, we did also some interviews with, with relationship managers and we know that it's a very, very busy day and there are lots of topics a relationship manager needs to talk, but we also know how important um, and futuristic a climate related topic will be. So we would really, really love to know what percentage of all your client meetings may be today this topic is already one. So I think you can vote on your screens and um, yeah, very curious to see. Um, just wait a second. Do we see the, do we have the results? Okay, so 20% have no um, climate related topics today and 20 um, so 25%, so 40% of, of, of the audience have 
25%. That's very interesting. And oh, just and 6% of, of the audience do have 100% of all of their, of their client meetings are with um, including climate related topics. That's a very interesting um, distribution. So of course, this, this work is here to enable the relationship managers to talk and we will see an increase in in client meetings which are covering this topic more in the future so thank you for that so how does this guide work i guess many of you have already had the chance to download our interactive pdf so it's a currently an interactive pdf you can click through the faces you can click through the target outcomes um, and today, um, how does it work? So as a, it's currently a, as a reference to inform client um, conversations. It can be for immediate use, so if, if the organization bank is ready for that. But we do also see banks using it for to educate their employees first and then also to adapt it to their own organizational needs. Currently, it's um, sector agnostic, so um, that means we will, in our future work, focus on more on sector um, relevant um, topics. And primarily, it's designed for large corporate clients, which will also be uh, tackled in, the, in our future work, um, for example, in our SME Climate Hub work. Um, we designed this guide, um, keeping in mind the busy days of relationship managers and the vast topic they need to cover. Even when we just think about the UK relationship managers dealing with Brexit, for example. So we try to reduce the complexity of, of the climate change transition topic as much as possible. But at the same time, we need also to represent um, all the re relevant topics. Um, we try to reduce the complexity also in that way that we know that um, banks to banks are posed several questionnaires so for, for example the cdp financial institutions questionnaire we took we teamed up with cdp as well um, to align these questions so that so once the relationship manager asks a question that's client it goes through the bank into the portfolio and into the reporting so that it's all aligned and all um, based on actually the same um, form of, of information um, the topic of, of the transition of our economy towards uh, net zero is a trans transformational one. So you can see this also here. We have five faces, we have 45 questions, and we are also offering 85 resources. So this is an evidence that this guide cannot fit into a business as usual way of doing things. So the bank's operating model, like we posed in Bank 2030 work, um, represented by Annabelle earlier, um, needs to fit to the sustainability strategy as well. So what outcomes can you expect from, from our guide is to deepen the understanding of your client's business and financing needs, so building stronger partnerships. Secondly, you will have clarity on where the bank can innovate and derive commercial benefit, which is in line with the Paris Agreement. And third, the banks can decarbonize its portfolio and deliver also on the net zero commitments they, they made. So on the next slide, I would like just to zoom into the structure um, so here we, we see the assess phase zoomed in. So the guide each, um, before each phase, um, you are given support in the why each phase is important, how to prepare, and what meaningful questions to take into the client's dialogue. So we help out with the resources. We know there's a lot of information out there and it's, um, so we did this work for a year to, to cut it down to see what's what's uh, most relevant and so that the bank's banker can learn and yeah and also to be able to signpost for the client um, we also foresee that relationship managers will return to this uh, to the guide as as we go in the transition journey with a with a client as the journey progresses and um, and the financing strategy progresses as well. We are also very cognizant that relationships managers cannot do an act alone, so they will need support from the organization. And this is also where um, we say also where 
um, we made some suggestions to this too. So in brief, each phase will detail the why and puts um, it into the topic. The phase will tell the relationship manager how to prepare um, for the discussion, what meaningful questions to ask, where to find resources and who to partner up with in the bank. Now let's zoom into the phases on the next slide. Um, as you can see here, we have a circle which represents a chronolo chronological journey. The five phases are setting the scene, assess, design, structure and review. The client transition journey will not be done only in one sitting or two with the client. Um, this circle represents the whole transition journey of a client, of a corporate and therefore maybe it will take five to ten years. Um, this is why we say the relationship manager will come back to the to the client. So we don't expect all phases being set up. Maybe some phases of you already started in, within the bank. So let's have a look at these at the phases itself. So in setting the scene, the bank. So the bank can set the scene, how the bank can open up the conversation, and how the bank can start this dialogue. So this phase can also be done um, for the bank as a whole. For example, in client, um, in client workshops, and it's an opportunity to position the bank, which has taken sustainability as uh, very, very seriously. <laughs> um, now the assess phase. Assess phase is about digging deeper where the client is and client starting position actually. It's about client's carbon footprint, it's grasps of risks and opportunities which come with climate change. It's about understanding client's innovation structure, um, which can lead to change of the business operating model, or mostly it should change. Once you have understood where your client is, you know how much time you need to spend in the design phase. The design phase is about supporting your clients in des designing the transition plan. So we are very cognizant that this might be outside of banks' remit to design um, transition plans for the clients. But this phase shows banks' support and knowledge to signpost partners in this field. Every business will need to design their own climate action plan. And while the, this design phase sits outside of banks' remit, it remains in the relationship manager's sphere of influence. So it is not um, it should not be structured, so the, the, the client should not structure it um, without the support on the KPIs um, which are financeable and it should fit the strategy. Alongside the client putting together their transition plan, the design phase also ties in the bank skill as they put together the overall vision for short, medium and long term finance strategy to support the client's transition plan. It's recommended that companies link up and check for the KPIs. In the next phase, the structure phase, so this is the phase where the, each bank can be at their best with their innovative, innov innovative products. And um, in this phase, it's about the product offering um, and the opportunities are crystallizing. So here we need to see the fit between the transition plan and the financing strategy which also can mean to change the current financing commitments into completely new ones. So the bank needs to be open to this as well. And we're, here the relationship manager is working with the product specialists um, to make sure that all of these, the, the whole vision with the short, medium and long term um, goals is supported. And this is of course where the revenue happens. And then we have the last phase and the last phase is a review phase and we've foreseen this if once this guide is implemented to be the longest phase. So this is about making sure that the client is delivering on the agreed KPIs. But really important is also to share what was learned along the journey with others in form of best practices and to, this expansion of knowledge and making sure everyone is, is driving that, that strategy. So the, the the world once we've um, once we've arrived in the in the review phase the world will for sure have been changed and we will have some new research and the set the transition pathways will, will look different so 
in the end, when the review um, is accomplished, we start to set the scene again, but maybe in a couple of years because the world has changed. Okay, so these are the five phases. Um, I would like to go back to you, dear audience, um, and ask you our second poll question um, to see which phases you think your bank is delivering on today. Um, we are very, um, we know that relationship manager can't act alone, so there must be some supporting infrastructure from, um, from the risk department, from the strategy department, from the communications department, from product department. And so they all need to support um, the relationship manager to really be able to deliver on what, what's offered. Um, and maybe some, some of you who are now listening you already had set the scene or the, you, are, you set the scene and you have assessed your clients or you assess your clients, you designed and structured and maybe you've done all of them. So it would be really nice to see um, the votes and to see how, where your bank is delivering on today. There we go. Oh, I'm very surprised. So we have 34% are in setting the scene, 40%, so the majority are setting the scene and assessing already. That's very, very good to hear. 16% are designing and structuring and 10% doing all of it. So um, thank you very much for, for this. It's very encouraging, I think, also for you to see, okay, there is some movement um, in the market. Um, Everyone is doing something. So if a bank is not doing anything, you know, okay, it's time, it's time to move. Thank you very much. And now ne next slide and last slide about, about the, the questionnaire. I would like to deep dive into just one particular question. So you see here, we, um, we have the assess phase um, question or the topic number 2.4. And um, it's about, the company and how the company is transitioning. I just want to showcase how the questionnaire is built up. You have here three roles, the how, the what, and the where. So how can the relationship manager best prepare? So identifying the existence of a credible transition plan. And if this um, plan is aligned with the um, Paris Agreement and company's commitments. So what questions to ask? So is there a transition plan or not and are, is the client clear on how the business operations and financing needs will evolve? Um, does the client work with external specialists to determine these goals and opportunities and also transition in, in, um, in aligned with sector leadership? And how is the organization performing against the sector transition pathways? So these are very high level big questions which each bank later in the later stage can kind of adapt to their organizational needs on in the third row we say we are giving you support um, with resources so we have here uh, five five links where we say okay this is where we would start to prepare for this one particular question and for example we have transition pathway initiative which is already today assessing um, sectoral transition pathways of approximately 400 companies and, and maybe one of your client is part of that of this assessment already and this is where you can derive your um information from so they're i think mostly focused so more, mostly focused on large corporate clients currently but they're expanding their companies so that's a one one source for this kind of information um and as we, as we mentioned before, um, we don't foresee that um, it's in bankers' remit to design a transition plan, but there are external partners where the banker can signpost to, and one of these are is ACT from CDP, so assessing the low carbon transition, and their service is to um, come up with a credible transition plan where um, we move towards a 1.5 degree company and um, just to give one example of that. Good, then we move to the last slide um, for this presentation. Um, 
So how can your bank now use this guide? So this work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0. That means that the license requires um, the reuser to give credit to the creator, um, but it allows all um, reusers to distribute, mix, adapt, and build up on the material, so even for commercial purposes. Um, on this flowy, flowy line, you see that um, what we as CSL deliver, we said, okay, we will develop this um, guide and we will launch it together and we will also have some workshops with our, um, with some BI members or with all BI members. But from now on, we are giving it into the space, so with you, the audience, and um, so it's up to you to take it into your organization, to brainstorm and pilot it and adapt it to your organizational needs, and really to active use it in client engagement and to drive this impact. And you see also from the flow chart that um, the next step is for us to again to pick it up and to make the next um, addition. So this is a this will be a living thing. This guide we will um, have some improvements and for future editions, um, and we will also we are aiming for digitalization. So this um, interactive PDF will once be digital tool. You also see here where this um, on this um, flow chart you see where this work is coming from, like we said, okay, we had the phase one bank 2030. Um, from there, we said, okay, we want to push the banks further to be leaders in the space. Um, this is why we are developing a bank, bank client engagement guide. We will um, develop the bank client engagement guide um, further in 2022, but now we are focusing on the Unipify TCFD program and also the SME Climate Hub, so where um, Annabelle can tell us more about. Great, now I'm giving over back to Annabelle. Thank you so much for listening. Brilliant, Yasminka, thank you very much um, for a very, very teasing, <laughs> teasing um, introduction to the guide. There is a lot more to um, the guide um, and something that um, that we obviously had to do because of the complex topic is explain um, beyond the, the different phases what net zero means to a bank and its clients, the integration into existing business practices. And we, we picked out a few elements of overcoming barriers to progress as well. Um, and hopefully, and I'd like to invite the panelists to, to turn on their videos and unmute themselves now, um, we will be able to dig into those a bit deeper. Things like the questions we've been seeing coming in, sector specificity, KPIs, capital requirements. Um, I will do a brief introduction of our panelists, thank you all for joining, um, and then we'll dig straight into questions. Um, firstly, we've got Thomas Vergunst, Programme Director of Finance Sector of Education at CISL, so one of my, one of my colleagues. Um, we have Peter Canning, Global Head of Business Development in Sustainable Finance at HSBC. Delphine Kenia from BMP Pariba. She is Global Head of Sustainable Finance and Solutions in Global Markets. And David Carlin from UNEPFI, who's the Program Lead of TCFD and Climate Risk. Welcome and thank you very much. Um, so what I'll do today is, is start off by trying to keep us within the, the phases that Yasminka talked us through. And um, first of all, ask a few questions around set the scene. And we've had a few come in. So if I'm looking that way, it's because of the questions. Um, and perhaps, Peter, let's start with you, because there is that debate of how, how strong can a client facing team be when banks are only just forming net zero strategies? So if you'd like to talk us through what it's been like, um, as much as you can share, but recognizing um, we're representing the banking sector here, what it's like to set a net zero strategy and what that means for your clients. If you could um, share a bit with us there. Yeah, thanks, Annabelle. Um, I think it's a great question to start off with, with a guide about having conversations with our clients around climate change and sustainability. Um, we, like all companies, I guess, are on an evolution or a journey when it comes to our climate agenda. And I've recognized that change over time and the phases we've gone through. So early on, I felt like much of our focus was just building awareness and getting people talking and understanding about climate change and what are the risks and opportunities that presents to us as an industry, but also to our clients and just the scale of change required to address the Paris Agreement goals. Um, 
then we moved into once that awareness was built, building out our capabilities. And most of that focus was on building products that were had some integration of sustainability criteria into that. And you've seen that in the market, I guess, in 2017, when we as a bank set our first commitments, there was really just green bonds as a labeled product in the market. And over the intervening years, we've seen a, a suite of products now that have specific um, sustainability criteria that can be applied. And I think that's been a really helpful platform to enable conversations with clients. And what I've seen most recently then is similar to what we see with uh, governments and other organizations and is a coalescing around net zero as a concept and an appreciation that these one-off transactions or specific label transactions isn't sufficient. You need to have a more holistic review of what does this mean for your business. And so last year, HSBC made its own net zero commitment. Um, we weren't the first, uh, many others have joined us. And I think especially in April this year, the, the Net Zero Banking Alliance um, coming together, I think close to 50 banks were part of the initial set and many others will join. So I think that's a really important evolution of the market. Um, what this means for us as financial institutions, I guess, is um, an appreciation that banks have these touch points across different sectors, um, different types of companies and clients. And importantly, I think for companies like BNP Paribas or HSBC and many others, is that we work across different geographies. And I think that considering climate change as a global universal challenge across different types of companies, different geographies, um, this change is required everywhere. And I think that's why many people turn to the financial sector as one of the levers of influence and why I think this, this guide to discussion, discussing with clients is so important. And I, I guess drawing from our own experience is one of the things that we have to share with clients is our own implementation of our journey around implementing or developing our sustainability plans. I think um, something Yasmika has talked about or touched on is also the, the ability to share perspective and, and experience or case studies um, with our clients. And convening power, I think, is also really important in seeing that um, in different forums or financial institutions as well as businesses from other sectors come together to talk about how do we problem solve. Um, and part of it are the, the financial instruments or capital that we can provide, but also understanding our clients' needs better um, to, to address climate change. There's a common goal there. And I think all of that is really powerful. And then ultimately, of course, is the ability to provide financial solutions that meet these goals. So that's kind of my summary of, of you know, our journey as a, as a bank around net zero, but also what it means for our clients and how we can contribute. I think this is really well reflected in, in the guide itself. And we've gone a lot into awareness and education and there's that there's the need to build greater capacity to recognize that there's a there's a huge challenge that needs to be addressed urgently and we can't rely on a few specialists there's a question that's come in that I think Thomas would suit the education piece, which um, is is about assessing the gap and well, how, how do you address the gap between the current qualifications of bank advisors and the industry um, expertise required for this process? And obviously, you've seen some, you've seen lots of in the work you've done with the financial sector. What what kind of trends are you seeing, and how can we begin to close that gap um, so that action happens? Yeah, it's a very valid question, I think, particularly because the space is moving so fast and we don't necessarily have all the solutions and all the answers. And um, so we're definitely seeing a massive uptick in, in kind of interest in education across all fronts, both from our graduate education, but also I sit within our customized executive education, which is you know, a customized program for individuals, organizations, really trying to get on top of the strategic and the practical implications of the transition to kind of a low carbon economy. Um, but also there's been a, a, a big rise in kind of online um, offers as well and training courses specifically around sustainable finance and, and climate change and the implications as a way of allowing people to not have to go back to university in busy lives and with a lot going on already, but actually to be able to learn on the go in much more kind of incremental bite-sized chunks. And, and so I think that kind of adaptability um, and, and people being able to revisit their learning throughout their career is definitely a trend we, we're seeing and I think really important in this space 
because it is moving very quickly and, and the trends and examples of what good and leading practice practice is changes almost from, from year to year. So, um, and there's lots of resources out there. Do look at our website, there's in, information there about the education office. There's a plug if, uh, if you're wanting to find out more about education. So. And I guess um, there's from education, we need to move into action. And Delphine, perhaps this is where we start to move, move around. Um, and I'm going to jump past assess and go into the design and structure phase. And um, we've had a question focused on how KPIs are different from industry to industry. Um, it's from, I, oh, I won't say the name because I'm not sure I'm allowed to. So, um, but um, what do your, what, in your experience of dealing with clients from a, from a talking about decarbonisation strategies, working out a funding strategy to support um, that investment, what have you seen as good practice? And, and we're aware of the greenwashing element that, that we're seeing um, in the press. What are you seeing as the leading practice that can help avoid that? And how do you work with your clients? Okay, um, I think that's a, a, a very important uh, question, the one you're asking about uh, greenwashing. Uh, to start with, um, client engagement is absolutely critical when, when it comes to sustainable finance. It's a very collaborative uh, effort. This is why we're supporting the, this guy. And I completely concur with uh, my colleagues here and HSBC. You know, joining Net Zero is part of your own journey, but it's also part of a more global alliance of banks, 43 banks have decided to do that and we all are doing it our own way but ultimately trying to achieve the same goal. So what we are trying to do when you want to avoid greenwashing is really to focus on two things. What is important and material for your client sector in particular and the ambition uh, of the reduction of emission uh, uh, emissions in, in a particular sector. The issue is not the past or the existing uh, emissions from a particular sector or a particular company, but uh, the forward-looking uh, path. So we encourage companies to have their, their own targets approved by the science-based uh, targets initi initiative, if possible, uh, to ensure that the targets are in line with the Paris uh, uh, one and one five degree uh, uh, pathways. The sub targets can be defined as well to drive progress, but it's very important to try to be as 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 uh, specific as possible for a particular sector, but nevertheless also have a common language, common uh, target. Um, it helps, as you've heard, <laughs> to have your own uh, pathway. Uh, I think it's very relevant to engage with your clients on what you're doing yourself to align your own portfolio, how you are doing yourself to reduce your scope three uh, emissions and the difficulties you have when, when doing this because you relate much better uh, to your clients. And we do encourage our bankers in particular to, uh, to involve SF experts uh, in all client interactions because it would be very easy to think that uh, you can speak ESG uh, uh, quite easily. In fact, it takes a little bit of time to understand the materiality of each sectors, the specific issues of, uh, of uh, linked to reducing scope one, scope two, scope three, um, and, and therefore uh, it helps to have uh, an expert involved. Uh, more and more uh, investors are focusing on scope three, for instance, uh, and it's very different <laughs> from uh, one sector to another. A commercial land loan might be expected to uh, to be ten times uh, uh, of its, you know, having scope three emission ten times higher than its scope one and two, and it could be completely different from another sector. So speaking the right language, having a common language of a uh, of reference is is part of this journey to avoid greenwashing and then ambition of the targets. Yeah, uh, moving moving through the, the KPIs, the benchmarks, the sector specific things. David, from your UNIPFI perspective and, and the broader picture, really taking this out into the, the finance sector and how they can help the underlying economies that they support, what are you seeing as the tailwinds um, that help accelerate action on climate? Yeah, th thanks a lot, Annabelle. It's, it's great to be here, and that, that's a, a really good question because 
you know, my, my oh my, it feels like there's, uh, there's quite a lot of wind in our sails these days, which is um, terrific. Um, of course, as um, Peter had mentioned with the Net Zero Banking Alliance being launched um, and the Glasgow um, Financial Alliances for Net Zero, um, those collective efforts, there's a lot of work that um, we at UNFFI are doing on the convening side. But I, I would really like to kind of target three different um, drivers or three different um, kind of collective wins. Um, the first being um, starting with those initiatives. I think that there is a growing um, corporate uh, energy toward this and in the financial sector, a tremendous desire to recognize that this, that this goal of net zero is not something that makes you a green outlier but very soon will be compulsory or near compulsory because this is where your peers are going and this is where your customers and your employees expect you to go. And I think we tend to jump best when we jump together. And so these collective organizations, um, and again, I'm not unbiased as we are the conveners of the Asset Owner Alliance and the Banking Alliance, but to say there's been a ton of really good work from the institutions within there to challenge each other and push each other to um, to adhere to standards and make this not just a um, a reach goal, but rather to reset the expectations within the sector. So I think the first is coming internally from institutions. The second, and we we can't you know um, overstate the importance is is the regulatory push. We're just seeing constantly a awareness of regulators picking up again on the private sector initiative of the TCFD. But just last Friday, we had the executive order from the Biden administration um, directing Se Treasury Secretary Yellen to um, more fully explore um, climate related financial risks. Of course, um, we've seen guidance and, and requests for consultation, both from the US SEC, as well as the BEIS in the UK. Um, there's been um, good work done on piloting exercises that begin to explore stress testing, whether um, the impending stress testing in the UK or results from exercises like those um, within France. Um, the ECB recently released um, just yesterday a quite interesting paper about some of their assessments of how institutions are exposed. And I think these things, this recognition of rising standards, this recognition of um, mandates and potential future sanctions, even though right now we're seeing far more carrot than stick, those things definitely matter. And then the final point is the real economy itself. We're not in the same place we were in 2010. And I think that this is why it is so valuable to look at what the IEA has put out as really a state of the art view of getting to net zero and why it will be so immensely interesting and valuable to see what NGFS releases um, in early June with their scenarios, and also what the IPCC releases in their, their latest assessment report um, in the next several months, because these are really updating the key assumptions about our world and the world that we looked at several years ago, a world where solar was quite expensive, but plunging in cost, a world where coal was um, growing. It's a very different shape and the business opportunities and whether it's the social license on the consumer side to continue these activities or the simple economics of levelized cost of electricity being cheaper for renewable sources, improvements in battery power. These are things that I think institutions are highly aware of. So even if you were to strip out the collective effort, even if you were to strip out the regulatory mandate, there is a strong and ever strengthening business case for this type of work. And what that means is really taking institutions that you're working with, taking clients by the hand and understanding where they are and what role they see themselves playing. But coming at this, I think a great thing that banks can do and one of the real valuable pieces that, that I see of the work that, that you've done is to recognize that financial institutions and banks um, in particular have such a wide remit over their exposure to the real economy. And in some ways that can help to show where the pieces fit together and to get outside of a particular industry or activity and into how these pieces connect in terms of supply chains, in terms of markets. And I, I really think that this is the place where finance can really um, pump the gas on this 
you know, no pun intended, on this um, transition. And, and, and I see that economic rationale being not only a strong case for engagement, but also an urgent case for um, future competitiveness and, and opportunity seeking. Thank you, David. I mean, that's a really good summary of the interconnectivity of everything we do. And I think it's worth me highlighting at this point um, that the guide, and it's been a question, is, is why are we focused only on climate in this, in this particular webinar? Perhaps in the guide as well, I'm not sure. But that is because we've got a huge complex topic. We at CISL and the banks as well, I presume, are very aware of how interconnected sustainability is. And that's the nature related elements, that's social, that's economic. And it's a very global issue as well. There's a lot of complexities. For, for the ambition of, of being able to share something that can move the needle. We simplified into a core essence, um, but we are very aware of that and, um, and look forward to hopefully building out similar um, and then more advanced guides in, in different topics that bring together those different pieces. Um, we're getting quite a lot of questions. We've talked about tailwinds, David, and we've, we've heard some positive stories, but we are getting quite a lot of questions that we cannot ignore, bearing in mind um, the, the group we are, about the obstacles as well and there are two main um core things and if one is one is capital requirements and and the fact that if we saw in the poll um we had the set the scene in the assess phase as the web where most banks or the majority have felt they got to what what if we get stuck here is the question where, where the design and structure phases are hampered by the, the the considerable changes that need to happen in the way that banks risk teams the regulatory structures and the incentive structures within banks um, work and then the second one we'll come on to perhaps is um is what happens if nothing changes if the if the client isn't ready to move the, the sector isn't ready there aren't viable alternatives but if we tackle i'll tease that one afterwards if we could tackle and um, perhaps that capital requirements and building on what david said i i, th I think i'd like to bring um delphine or peter in at this point um whoever feels ready to to opine on on the need for capital crimes and what kind of change we might like to see. Delphine, would you like to, to start? Um, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I think you, you're absolutely right. There is a, a need for uh, building capacity and therefore helping uh, investors to basically um, convey their expectations to, uh, to issuers to attract private capital. Uh, two issuances. So it's part of the work, obviously, to listen well to um, uh, investors and bridge the requirements of uh, potential issuers and investors and, and to try to see, you know, how these can be, uh, can be done. Sometimes it's easy because, uh, uh, for instance, a potential issuer is moving very fast. Uh, they will have their own experts. Uh, and we can have discussions immediately at the right level on the decarbonizing strategy. Sometimes it's, uh, we need to take a step back and have multiple conversations at different uh, uh, level in the organization with different uh, people, including support team teams uh, and so on, to progressively you know, help shaping a, a particular uh, strategy. Uh, uh, sometimes it goes so quick that, you know, for instance, we've been involved with a, with a company who didn't have a head of it, ESG in November, uh, but we had extensive discussions in Jan, the uh, head of ESG was recruited in, in February, they went to the market. So it was spectacular in terms of uh, uh, speed of action. There are obviously lots of ways of uh, building capacities and it's not just about uh, banks, but it's, uh, there are also different type of products and, and obviously we know the roles also of uh, the public sector who can help in some specific areas uh, with their risking projects or, or helping where maybe banks have more difficulties and, and banks I think have a huge role to play in creating or promoting together with investors uh, transparent frameworks, uh, robust frameworks and, and making sure that uh, transparency on user proceeds, how funds are being allocated, how they can be um, uh, they they can be uh, put to use actually with a positive impact um, uh, is being um, is being incentivized. So all these all these elements uh, help with building capacity. Um, we know very well that there are some uh, areas where it's, it's quite easy to raise funds, or for instance, uh, in the IG world, it's more easy than in sub-investment grade 
the summit of the Great One in emerging markets, you've got your specific, specific challenges as well that uh, uh, are to be tackled specifically. So this is this is how we think we can build capacity, which is to really target the pockets, the gaps in the financing, and address them by having the right uh, frameworks and, as was mentioned earlier on, right engagement between the uh, different parties. Indeed, so there is certainly a role for for policy in this space and for building building a, a, a structure that can create a, a risk basis but also some opportunities where we can mobilize capital towards those which um is very much where the guide's starting from is is seeing this as a proactive stance an opportunity that that banks of the future will will move towards as fast as possible as a competitive advantage that has a positive impact on the societies that we work in um peter would you like me to would you like to add anything on there yeah i guess um maybe as just an observation i know of for several years, people have have this notion that if I'm doing the right thing, there should be some reward for me, and through pricing or some some kind of incentive, as it's often referred to. And I think, as David said and um, Delphine as well, but the, I think that there's been a maturing, I guess, to recognize that these are these are no longer just um, kind of altruistic activities these are really strategic decisions and we're talking about re reorienting how capital is applied to support things that are consistent with the goals of of the paris agreement or net zero and i think that th there's a little bit of still status quo rules or what's familiar and things that have been approved before are, are you can present with more confidence to an, a capital allocation committee or such but um, I think that we're moving into an area where there needs to be much more of a thoughtful um, decision making of thinking like applying a climate lens to all of these activities and having that be part of the decision making and approval process and to help get us around like overcome maybe some inertia that still maybe exists in how how we tend to operate is just um, what's been done before is, is easiest to do again. Super. I mean, tackling tackling that question of what what do you do if there is inaction, whether it is from the bank. I know we've got lots of um, other organisations on who have not yet made net zero commitments. There's also interactions happening in meetings where the client or the company is not seeing the the, the need to transition as a necessity, as I said, or or there is not an alternative viable um, solution. Thomas, would you like to come in because we haven't heard from you <laughs> recently and and have a comment, or if not, we can we can. I, mean, I can give my view from the outside. Full disclosure that I'm not a banker and I, these are not my clients, but I think from the evidence of the science and the direction of the scenario, saying which direction we need to travel, and there's greater clarity as David was alluding to around that direction of travel. I think there is going to have to be some hard hard decisions being made, and obviously I think the guide and the guide is set up to have those conversations and guide people through that journey and help them, you know, your customers and clients build resilient business models for the future. And but if there's ultimately no willingness and no uh, willing to, to drive and to change, then ultimately it might come down to some harder choices about, you know, do you divest or do you come out of business? And um, obviously that's a last resort. You don't want to do, you lose business and we need the whole of the economy to transition to be successful in this space. Um, but I do think there might be some hard decisions down the line if people don't, uh, respond and they might have to be some choices around that space and um, what their cutoff point is I'm not exactly sure but the scenarios are saying like um, you mentioned the International Energy Agency scenarios from last week it's pretty clear the extent of the transformation that is required so probably sooner than many would like to admit would be in my view. David do you have any comments on that from an outside an outsider perspective by no means an outsider but um, not a non-bank perspective? Yeah, well, having worked with a, a large number of of financial institutions, both um, in this work here, but also previously um, as a consultant, what what I would say is, I think a lot of the reticence exists not just because of fears of competitive positioning or a view that this is not important. I think maybe some years ago there was a little bit of that second one, but also I hear very often institutions saying 
we're not really sure what we're committing to and we don't want to just make a commitment and have it be seen as greenwash and i think that that's that's an important point which is understanding what pathway you are going to walk does require some thinking and anyone who i think is going to try to seize a pr coup by announcing net zero is going to find themselves under a tremendous amount of scrutiny when it comes to the execution of those plans and justifiably so but i think that that has been one area of reticence and granted these um regulations as well as these net zero um, alliances are beginning to pull that conversation to where maybe you can't be fully ready but you're you have to jump into the pool and i think that that's good when it comes to this question though of um of engagement um i had written a couple pieces about this sort of trade-off between divestment and engagement and it's it's a bit beyond perhaps the scope here to talk about the relative merits but i think the key is that institutions financial institutions need to be willing to make the hard choices it's it's always great to hear about the win-wins of oh we invested in this small um this small company that is providing solar panels here or oh we um worked with this municipality to build resiliency and that was you know a, a win-win but we have to be realistic and we when we look at these scenarios we see lots of businesses and lots of activities that will wholly be transformed or may not necessarily have a place in a low carbon world. And I think it means being realistic and part of being credible as an institution is being willing to make those hard choices. And again, I'm not saying one needs to divest, but if that option isn't genuinely on the table, if that option of really pushing hard against those who are more intransigent doesn't exist, if you you know only are filled with, um, with carrots for the for clients, then I think your claims are not going to be as effective and as credible. And I think there is a powerful effect within the financial ecosystem of the willingness to walk away, not necessarily that everyone should or that everyone has to, but I think the willingness to make hard choices to me, that is the thing that is proof positive, not the fact that one has divested, not the fact that one is planning to, but rather that those options are on the table to me is what gives leverage and gives the opportunity to really ascertain whether transformative change is possible in this instance or whether in fact it isn't and and in some cases unfortunately it, it won't be for certain companies and i think we we should also be uh be open to that and and recognize it as well very good conscious of time and um and i'm sure everyone else has got <laughs> got the next webinar to join. So I, at this point, I wish we could keep discussing and there are lots more questions that have come in. We as CISL will try to answer those um, with the participants directly after the call. But um, just to wrap up, a big thank you to the panelists. This has been a, a very interesting debate. We've tackled some important topics here of capital requirements, greenwashing, client inaction. Um, so I hope it was an interesting um, discussion. And just to remind you everyone, like this is well, to summarize, and, and David did it very well just then, decarbonizing the global economy is not going to be easy and it will involve some difficult decisions. And we just hope that this guide is, is a step in the right direction that makes those, those meaningful questions with clients and the preparation, making sense of the different resources that exist um, easier for, for not just banks. The, there's a financial institution application here and um, we encourage you to join the different pilots that are happening, the UNIFFI TCFD modules, the SME Climate Hub, we're looking into this from an SME perspective, and then the other um, groups at CISL, so ClimateWise, are likely to pilot um, this guide for the insurance sector. So lots of opportunities to, to dig in, but um, like Yasminka said, we it's, it's over to you. Um, we welcome feedback, and you can download it for free um, on the website, or if you Google CISL, let's discuss climate. And on the next slide, um, I encourage you to get in touch with me if you have any questions on the guide or on the Banking Environment Initiative. My email is on the slide. And um, Thomas Vergunst, who has um, joined us from our education team and very much there to, to support that, set the scene and all the way around the, the, the wheel of Let's Discuss Climate because it's, it's, it needs a big expansion of capacity. And um, on that note, we look forward to, to learning together and um, welcome you um, to to engage with CISL as you see fit. So thank you for joining us, in particular Yasminka, Thomas, Peter, Delphine, David, and the team behind the scene, Anna and Jason as well. Um, it's been great to chat to you today and um, look forward to future work and discussions together. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much.